I bet you never asked the question, what if Sturgill Simpson, Pink Floyd, and Mars Volta had a baby and then raised it on cornbread and bottles full of moonshine? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've got the answer for you, and that is Waylon Whitson and Stephen Cottle of Technicolor Nightmare. Yes, sir. Who wrote the the about <laughs> section on y'all's Facebook page? Because it, it's it's great. That, that was, was me, dude. <laughs> that was good me. job. Like the more I kept reading it, the more I like I found like the little subliminal things that you put yeah. in there, like the uh, the <clears throat> band Laden. It's hilarious. Yeah. That that is hilarious. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah, it's good. really good stuff. Yeah. How, how y'all boys doing? Doing good, man. It's uh hanging in there. Monday morning. Yeah. Monday afternoon, rather. At this juncture, doing good. Yeah, yeah. And and, and we've been trying to make this happen for a while now. Finally made it happen. Since what, November? It's been a while, dude. Like yeah. A minute now. <laughs> it, it's been, you know, and a few speed bumps along the way, but we made it happen, yeah. by gosh. Got around that COVID. <laughs> yeah. So, so you got a new album on the way that mm. I'm very, dude, I've been a fan of y'all since I first watched the uh, music video that y'all released last year. And... I know that rock exists in the hills of Eastern Kentucky, but mm-hmm. nothing like y'all's, man. It's a uh, what? How would y'all even consider like what genre do you put yourselves in? Because rock is is such a weird genre because there's so many subgenres right. in it. What I do think, y'all call y'all selves? Well, we, we try not to. We try to. It's we good. try not to define ourselves. And I mean, there's all the subgenres, all that stuff. Uh, we just like to call it rock and roll, man. Well, that, well, that's what I mean, it should be. There's some funky, bluesy influences in there. Sometimes we get heavy. Sometimes we get a little psychedelic. I mean, it's just it's all over the place, but it's rock and roll. I, I, just I, as straightforward as we could put it, you know. I, I, I think it makes sense to do to to, to put it like that. Yeah, because why, why why you know why square yourself away in a little tiny box, you know? Yeah. Well, whenever artists start putting themselves in boxes, that's. Uh, it just ain't good. That's when the music gets repetitive, songs well, sound the same. Boxes were created so that they could figure out what demographic would like what artist or what song more. So mm-hmm. they put everybody in a bull box and they ship them off to that part of the world where they'll sell the most. Yeah. And without being intentionally different, that's just the way it came out. It's the way you hear it. So, it's not like we sat around and decided, okay, this next song is going to be totally different from the first one. That's just what happened that day. That was just the general mood of the day. A lot uh-huh. of our stuff's written through improvisation. So, cool, it's just, man. It's, it, it's all different, but it's the same. And so, I think we've maintained that pretty, pretty well. You know who you're hearing, even though it's not like the song you may have heard before. I get what that you're saying. I, I get it. So, so uh, y'all's demographic, have you noticed... Any demographic kind of uh, clinging to you more than others or anything? Well, <laughs> I run a lot of uh, a lot of Facebook ads and stuff like that because I mean you just have to. Yeah. In this day and age with with, uh, with social media and, and Facebook's where most of our audience is, and I would say it's probably like sixty percent like twenty five to thirty four males <laughs> for the most part, like just people around our age dudes our age that are that like hearing some uh more authentic rock music stuff that's yeah. not super duper polished and and programmed to death you know well we'll see to, to, to me y'all sound like bands and I'm, I'm not trying to categorize y'all or anything but oh, this yeah. is just like my opinion whenever i first heard y'all like bands like saliva or hell yeah kind of like the, the the rock that you heard right after grunge kind of died out and yeah like i, I never right? I, I never really knew what to call bands like uh well of course saliva and hell yeah what was the other one uh mud vein and bands mm-hmm. like that stabbing westward yeah exactly and y'all have that sound but i've just never been able to kind of like put that into a uh, category i think the official name for that genre of rock is uh, or like the most agreed upon is post grunge Really? That's yeah, like Breaking Benjamin, all that kind yeah. of stuff. That vein, yeah. I think that's what most people call it. Oh, that if man, it was. But that was like a that was a style of rock that you know not a lot of people talked about. You know, I'll take that because yeah. that was like the last time that rock was commercially viable. Yeah, you know, it, was, right. it was around that time period. Well, well you had you had click man. click boom from Saliva. Mm-hmm. You you wouldn't know by hell yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the list goes on and on. I like love mud vein. So. <laughs> what was that one song of theirs? I'm Dig, probably. Right. No, uh, it's another song. 
It was the first time that I ever heard Mudvayne. Happy, maybe? No. This man, whenever the first time that I heard bands like them and Seether and stuff like that, I was a. Uh, this when I grew up in Georgia, mm. and I remember on Saturday nights at two o'clock in the morning, there was this local TV station that would play rock music videos, and I was raised like on classic rock, you know, with uh, my dad was like '60s hippies era, mm. my mom was '70s kind of progressive rock, and mm-hmm. my brother mm-hmm. was just all out hair metal Mm -hmm. but i never listened to a lot of the new bands i just listened to a lot of the uh older bands but uh yeah that they like they played like two o'clock in the morning i'd always stay up and watch that and that's how i learned about bands like mudvayne and seether and all that man i can't even find the song that i'm thinking about that's how old it is but uh hey mudvayne is a great great band though yes you never hear people talk about those even saliva I think they're starting to get a bit of a, a cult following going again. Like people are starting to look back at that time period and be like, "Oh, okay, there's some pretty dope music coming out." Then. Do what <laughs> you do. That was okay. the song I, I don't was know thinking if I about. I know that one. So it's a good one, man. I'll check it out after this. That's the first yeah. Mudvayne song that I ever heard. But uh, yeah, now, man. we've got a lot of influence from like progressive rock and stuff, like you were talking about too. Like I grew up, my dad loves Pink Floyd and Jethro Tull and stuff like that. I grew up listening to a lot of that stuff, and then. You know, I was a young, angsty teenager around the time period that you're talking about. So I was, you know, I discovered yeah. metal and, and things of that nature then. And there's a little bit of everything in what we do. I mean, it's all yeah. over the place. See, I like the message that y'all are pushing right now <laughs> with the whole rock is not dead. Mm-hmm. Because to many people that just follow mainstream music, that may seem like the case. Mm-hmm. But it's not the case at all. You just got to dig for it yep. a little bit yeah, more around a little bit and then, uh, shout out we also just dropped some new t-shirts with that on the back of them so yeah man <laughs> I, I like the uh, the hoodie that y'all dropped yeah. that, that looks awesome yeah. yeah we're good looking good looking designs who, who do y'all and, and man the yeah the designs are awesome because they're they're futuristic they're psychedelic i don't know exactly how to explain it who makes y'all's designs that would be me <laughs> do you do everything i do a lot of things man <laughs> well, what 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 made y'all run with the skull what's the whole thing about the skull this is reminiscent of the last time we were in this room isn't yeah it? <laughs> it, it's not just a skull but mm-hmm. it's basically what the album's about he's uh a disembodied head that uh, has special powers and comes from another dimension. His yeah, name is Scotty. That's what and you named it. Yeah, yeah. he has a name. Yeah, cool, his name's Scotty, and uh, he's kind of like the driving, motivating force to the whole concept behind the album and and who he is and what he wants and things of that nature. I mean, I don't, it's it's difficult to go into because man, if we were really trying to explain the concept to you, we'd be here for two hours. Trying to like lay it out. It's like yeah. you, if you're watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. You know the Pepe Silvia uh-huh. where he's got all the all the stuff on the pin board behind him and he's like right here, man. <laughs> and it's like everything's connected. That's what it would be like. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it's good that y'all put that much thought into it though because it makes the the music interesting. Right. And yeah. you can tell that the artist actually cares about what it is other than just trying to make a hit record or mm-hmm. exactly. whatever. Well, this day and age, everybody just releases singles. It's one single after another after another and you don't really see a whole lot of concept albums yeah is is that what y'all are trying to do with all of your albums like concept albums like one song leads into another maybe maybe not all of them yeah i think that's sort of the tentative plan is to continue the story and and whatever amount of time it's natural you know what i mean like if there if it comes a point where we're like we're trying to shoehorn music into a concept and let it go you know whatever is natural that's what we generally try to go for well, well, the whole concept albums back in the day, I mean, that was, uh, it, it made the music more than just music. Right. It was it, it was an experience. Right. Like Pink Floyd's The Wall is a great example because you had the mm-hmm. movie that came with it. You had mm-hmm. the, the album that you couldn't just listen to number six. Or Sergio yeah. Simpson, Sound and Fury, man. That oh, yeah. Is so sick. That yeah. anime is so sick. I and and, and just like whenever you put on a record, like you, you can't just jump around. It's, you have to sit and listen to it to the front to the beginning. Right. And it's almost like a movie that you just kind of imagine whatever in your the, head. That was like the, it's exactly, exactly like yeah. a movie. I want each song to feel like a little vignette of its own. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so that's where we kind of straddled that line. Like we wanted to do a concept album, but we also wanted each song to be viable on its own. You know, so you can pick any song to listen to, but the optimal way to experience it would be front to back, listen to the album. 
You know, like, yeah. well, Pink Floyd had, you know, another brick in the wall, but you have, if you really want the experience, you have to listen to the happiest days of our lives mm-hmm. right before it. Mm-hmm. You you don't see that or often like, nowadays uh, in music. Spaces and uh, Young Lust. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. Big into Pink Floyd. Oh, Dude, I, your shirt, man, where did you get that? That's, uh, I've never seen that kind of a Pink Floyd shirt before. Honestly, man, I think my old lady picked that up at a Goodwill. Love Goodwill. Just, Shout out to Goodwill. They're Shout storing it, Goodwill. baby. Shout out to Goodwill for sure. They got all kinds of good stuff. Man, yeah, I, dude, I, I probably own at least fifteen Pink Floyd shirts, and that, and uh, we were talking about collecting vinyl right before we hopped on air, and mm-hmm. that's probably like the most vinyl that I have is Pink Floyd. I try to sort those out because, yeah, it's it's great to listen to an album like Dark Side of the Moon and just front to back. I probably have more Pink and Floyd, Pink Floyd inspired tattoos than I do T-shirts. Though. What kind of tattoos do you well, got? I mean, I got. On bricks the in the wall. Yeah. All over and like that's an ambigram that says pink one way. When you turn around it says Floyd Oh, one. that's sick. That's so cool. They mean a whole lot to me. A whole gigantic album. amount of, and I don't think anybody's yeah. ever done the concept album better than Pink Floyd. Oh, or no. just rock and roll in general. I don't know that anybody will ever meet or surpass surpass Pink Floyd what they did. I can agree with that. The For hundreds of years beyond their time like, no. we still haven't caught up with them. it's perfectly no. timeless like that music will be relevant forever and and if you look like see nowadays it's easy to create something that's experimental and weird and all that you just throw a bunch of random stuff together mm-hmm. back in the day man they had to splice tape they had I, if you if people like really read into the behind the scenes on pink floyd albums it's crazy the yeah. uh <clears throat> the time what was the producer of their al- album alan Oh yeah, Alan, I, you said I, it too quick. Alan. Yeah, he he was a he he was a solo artist himself. Uh, the Alan Is something Alan project. Wayton? Alan 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 oh, Alan Parsons. Alan Parsons. Alan, yeah. Alan Parsons project. Yeah, That's yeah. It. He uh he was the producer on that album. And for time, whenever you hear all the clocks, he actually went to an actual antique store and recorded all of the clocks individually. He did a and, good job with the field recording for that time period, man. Did, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, like they just and and the uh, the pennies. I forget how how they done it, but they just it is all this cool I information mean, like behind a, the like, scenes. Pink Floyd has left an indelible mark on all music that has existed since they were a thing. Like synthesizers would have never. I don't think they would have ever caught on like they did had it not been for Pink Floyd yeah, pioneering that and synthesizer. popularizing it. I mean, you wouldn't have like. It's kind of weird to think that you wouldn't have ain't nothing but a G thing if it wasn't for Pink Floyd. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, it's true. I've never fact. thought about it that way. They, That's a real they fact. They use synth and arpeggiators and stuff in their music yeah. when nobody else was doing it, and then their music got really popular, even though a lot of that was a part of it. And that, and that part of Dark Side is uh, a. <laughs> You listen to that, John and you're Carpenter, like, the 80s. that's that's all the the precursors to all this digital stuff that everybody uses now to create music. Like it wouldn't be what it is with if they had not done what they did at the time. Yeah, it wouldn't have been completely shifted the paradigms yeah. of of popular music. I think, and it was almost like poetry too. Yeah. Like if you read the lyrics, it's so deep. Mm-hmm. That's one band that it breaks my heart that we'll probably never get to go to a reunion show. Right. Yeah, we won't. There's two out of four members are dead and gone. We'll yeah. never, ever, two, ever see that. And the other two I couldn't know. care less about each other. Yeah. So <laughs> I know, and, and stuff like that breaks my heart, man. I mean, it would. I'll still try to go to a solo show whenever we're actually able to go to big shows like that again. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it breaks my heart, man. I'd Who would you go see? It. Would you go see Roger or would you go see Gilmore? I got a I got a hard hitting question for you. There's a point in seeing them both individually. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm enough. trying to think but of who like I would see one, first. You had to pick one, and like your budget was for one of them this year. Oh man, would same it be day, Waters same, or Gilmore? Yeah, same day, two different arenas. You had yeah. to pick one. That's a tough one. Gilmore. I don't know. Gilmore. I'm just going. I'm just going to say Gilmore. I'd probably go see Roger Waters just because everybody else is going to see Gilmore. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. Somebody's got to hold it out for him. Yeah. And your he was a big. Player, he was know, a big part of stuff. you know all that awesome the lyrical theatrical. content, yeah. content, and True. theatrics behind all that. But like, you, 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 you want to go hear another guitar player play the solo in time? That's not David Gilmore. It, that, that's, are, man, are that was going, a tough one. You gonna go hear stuff from the wall? With David Gilmore playing the lead guitar and having someone else 
singing all those parts instead of Roger Waters. Mm, that's a that's a you oh, got me. that's a you good got me. one. Turnabout's fair play. <laughs> I, I just always respected Gilmore as a musician, and that's why I would like to see him. But yeah, man, that's a tough one. God, that's that was a tough one. Gilmore is the expectation for what you ought to be if you're going to pick up a guitar. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. if you're going to do anything, do what that guy does because that guy is awesome. Did, did y'all listen to their last album? Uh, it, it was a few years ago, and, and it didn't get as big as it should have. I don't know that I've checked that one out, man. I'm I'm stuck in the old stuff. Yeah. I hate to be that way. I generally try to be very forward thinking about stuff. Well, it was it was weird anyway. Like if you, it, it was very experimental, and they only sing on the last song, and it's just for a little bit. Mm -hmm. it, I can't even tell you what the name of it is. That's how popular so, it got. Is it something like in the, the rivers? Was it something about rivers? Well, yeah, the, the the cover is like somebody in a river. I think it's like something about time. When I I don't know, I'll look it up here. The but, timeless uh, river. The time that sounds so good. Is that you're you're on to something there? It but sounds familiar to me. One of my favorite albums sounds by like them is the uh, Bill. The endless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The end. The endless river. Two thousand fourteen. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was named after that. What was it named after? Some of it is like, I, if Bell, I'm not mistaken, I think Bell. some of it is mm. B-sides from Division Bell that Gilmore reworked. and Maybe. If I'm not mistaken. Division Bell, it began. That's where I kind of fell off. I'm not a big, I'm not big into, I don't know the Division Bell very well. It was pretty synth heavy. I did, a lot of people will hate on the wall and like they love Dark Side more than they do the wall, but man, the wall's where I'm at. Okay, like, I, got, I got a question for y'all then. That grooviness. Dark Side or the wall? I'm the wall all the way. Animals. Oh, that's a good one. That's, I like I, I like Uma Guma. That, that's that's one of my favorite. Uma Guma is. Uh, but we, we, we can't we can't say what that stands for, but no. people can go Google that on their own time. Uma Guma, that was back in the Sid Barrett days. Yeah, man. So it was it was out there. A little flavor wild. of weird. That's what's up. Well, well, that was that was another thing too. They kind of started the whole. Well, I guess it's arguable because you had bands like the Grateful Dead and Jimmy too that was pushing the whole psychedelic scene, but they're the ones that really carried it on into the '70s. Yeah. I would say if Jimmy lived to the '70s, who knows what he would have done with psychedelic yeah, rock? It's well, hard to say. It's, it's kind of like the other psychedelic stuff is like feel good psychedelic. You know, ooh, we're having a good time dancing Fire at a music mountains, festival yeah. on drugs, yeah. and then there's Pink Floyd, which is like an introspective journey. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it can get dark at times. It's, it's probably going to. You know. <laughs> like, well, yeah. I, I never like really. Well, uh, they they pushed Grateful Dead pushed the psychedelic culture, but mm. as far as music, yeah, I just kind of consider them jam folk band. jam band. band. Yeah, jam band. Like, yeah. They started jam banding. Like, give them that. They started the whole jam band thing. Now there's a million bands that do exactly what they did, exactly the way they did it. Yeah. Like, good. You know. Good on. I just. I, <laughs> Grateful Dead never really did get me. Like yeah. Floyd, well, you can't even put any of those people in the same category. You, know? nah. you got the Grateful Dead, they did their jam bandy thing, which had elements of blues. But Jimmy played the blues, which had elements of psychedelic yeah. stuff. But Floyd added this whole other... Theatrics. The, the theatrical, uh, a deeper concept... Mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's just a whole big deeper. It's much, much deeper and more poetic than the rest of them. But have I you agree. seen that meme that's like Pink Floyd be like, we live in a society, and then a 15-minute guitar solo? <laughs> have you seen that meme? That's, that's basically I've what Animals that, is. It's just, yeah, it's just, we live in a society. <laughs> but but the thing is, though, man, it is, it is just a trip from front to the beginning with a Pink Floyd album. The first album that I ever heard by them was Dark Side of the Moon. And I remember my... Me as a little kid, my dad playing it for me, and it just blew my mind. Right. I'm like, this is music? Like, I, I just, I, I couldn't believe that it was this, it could, that music could be that complex. Right. You know, they kicked off Paul McCartney on that album. Yeah. He was supposed to be featured on there, and they said no. Yeah, he, he like him and uh, Paul McCartney and his wife like recorded well, stuff I mean, for like, it and if everything. You go back to the stuff that that uh, that. Pink Floyd was doing in the in the 60s and like the earliest earliest parts of their career there was a lot of shared influence between those two bands. Oh yeah, well like that, the Beatles they, and Pink Floyd kind of came up together in yeah. the same kind of scene. Well they were uh, both recording at Abbey Road Studios too. Right. And uh, they were wanting to have like a bunch of just random people doing the voices and stuff yeah. on the album like the one guy that done the laughing uh, I I forget who that was. I think that was like Nicole Kidman's dad or right. something like that. There that was like some weird yeah. fun fact. 
But uh, see, it's like, but to them though, it's like kicking off Paul McCartney. He was he like to us, that's like, oh my God, you would get rid of Paul McCartney. But to them, that's like getting rid of your cousin Jim. That, but still, like that he, records at the Paul, same get out of here. You know, come on, Paul. Your voice don't match what we're doing. In here. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, 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 well, apparently, like he was taking it, like he wasn't taking it serious enough. They said uh, he was joking around about some stuff, and to them, they were wanting to make like a really serious album. Mm-hmm. So they like he recorded stuff and everything, but they just said no, we ain't going to use it. They had a very serious message yeah. that they were wanting to convey that did not require anybody to be joking about it. It's exactly. Some serious content. We're but, trying to say something. But it was a very gutsy move on their part because before Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd wasn't anything. I mean, yeah, they, they had like the saucer full of secrets mm-hmm. and some of those, but I mean, before Dark Side of the Moon, they didn't have like a number one album. Or anything like that. Nobody really knew who they were. So to kick off a beetle on your album, that probably would have helped it skyrocket. That is a gutsy move on their part. The but it's respectful, too. It was too. the right move. Yeah. It was oh, yeah, the of right move 100%. But it wouldn't have been nothing had they not experienced what had happened with Sid at the time. Oh, that's, yeah. the kind of, that's the Sid's, kind of cajones that define great artists, in my opinion. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They didn't want to ride off of Paul McCartney's coattail, and he wasn't. Even, he didn't even get the message that they were trying to convey, mm-hmm. I'd say, is why they told him. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's exactly why they're done it. And it's, and it's so cool that they were that passionate, and well, they, they cared that much about what they were trying to do. They knew you they you need to see more that. artists do stuff like that nowadays. Mm-hmm. Say no to these big people that's trying to control what you're doing. Yeah, that's where we're at, man. We know we are not looking for a record label. Well, so, like obviously, we recorded an album without one, and we got to do whatever we wanted to do. On yeah, it. and that's and that's a beautiful thing that anybody in the entertainment field can do nowadays. Mm-hmm. Even when it's like when me with stand up comedy, I don't have to have a manager. I could be my own manager. With mm-hmm. y'all, you can literally be the producer, the executive producer, the manager, the publicist. But back in the '60s, you no hell no, you no, couldn't you do anything like whatever. that. I mean, you didn't have. Nobody was going to be able to build a recording studio on their own. Yeah. So, so when, days. yeah. So, whenever I learned that Pink Floyd said no to Paul McCartney, I had so much more respect for him. I was mm-hmm. like, "That is awesome, dude. It's a those guys, move. the best, the real best. baller move. Nobody's ever been better, or ever will be, in my opinion." When it comes to rock like that, I don't. Yeah, I'm. I don't know anybody that could like hold a candle to that. I mean, I feel like it transcends rock. Like Pink Floyd transcends rock and roll. It's not just rock and roll. And also how timeless their music is. Exactly. See, like be relevant a hundred years from now. Yeah, you, it will you, still say the same things about the human condition that it said then. Yeah, every, exactly. Every fifty years, uh, the sales for Dark Side of the Moon, the album will skyrocket again. And they'll be like, well. This hundred year old album's already went platinum <laughs> for the nineteenth, ninety fifth time. People didn't, just keep buying it. Didn't it, didn't they? Like, don't they the have the world Walmart. record for like? Don't they have the world record for like the most like the album that was on the charts for the longest? It was like two hundred and something weeks. Yeah, Dark Side was on like there that. for a long, long, long time. Yeah, there's like some statistic that like one out of five people in the United States owned that album at one time. One out of five out of Everybody. That's pretty sick. I, I don't know if that's right, but I'm pretty sure. Something like that. Mm. There's just all types of fun facts that I you can look it. up about that album. It's interesting. It's good stuff. Yeah. I just, that's like something that people will try to like push on other people. It's like, dude, you have to do this before you die. You have to sit down and listen to Dark Side of the Moon from front to back. You have to before you die. Like It's, it's an experience. It's like a rite of passage. H- have y'all you know? done the, uh, the Wizard of Oz thing? The oh, Dark yeah. Side yeah. of the Wizard of Oz? Yeah. 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 It, it's pretty wild. It's I've done the same thing with Enema and uh, and Nightmare Before Christmas. Did you know that? Uh-uh. Did you know that Tools, Enema, and Nightmare Before Christmas sync up pretty well too? Dude, like I bet that? that's crazy. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Whoa. Well, but to pivot Tool, off, that was another cool. band that was kind of experimental, had the long mm-hmm. songs and mm-hmm. kind of mainstream. They were close, K- kind of close to what Pink Floyd done. They were back in the day referred to as the, the Pink Floyd of that generation. I can mm-hmm. definitely see that. That makes and sense. It does make a lot of sense. They, look a at, lot of, for that Gen generation. X, early 90s lens, yeah, they definitely revolutionized what metal was about at that point in time. If you bring yeah. it down yeah. to its base elements, you know, they got a lot of the same things happening. They put things together a lot of the same ways, just songs and layers, and yeah, they thought about things more than just chorus, verse, chorus, verse, end of the song. Yeah. You know, they, they put a lot of thought into it. A lot of people don't 
really put that much thought into it. You don't have to now because your computer puts all the thought into it. Mm-hmm. So all you have to do is pick what you want to hear, and the computer does the rest. And you don't mm-hmm. even have you don't have to know how to play guitar. They make machines now that attach you attach it to the neck of your guitar so that you only have to just press a button what? to play a chord. You just whoop, an E. A G. For real, they have something like what's that called? Oh man, I don't remember what it's called. I don't know it, how to Google. It made me like furious that. to see it. <laughs> well, and, and, I straight up just hated on it. I was like, no way, this is this is wrong. You, you can't never... just pull the 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 technicality out of being a musician and call it doing something. You're not doing you can't anything. Pull the human element out of playing a piece of wood with steel strings stretched across it and like, achieve the same effect. The Sorry, chord buddy, never, never chord buddy, yeah, that's one of them. There's a couple of different designs. I didn't know Who's mind that blown, mind blown right now. How does that help? I didn't know this was a thing. What's that for? Why would you even need something like that? Why would you own a guitar if you were just going to buy that? A forty five bucks on Amazon. What I what I what kind of drives me crazy, and they, to each his own, I guess. I can't be too judgmental, but I just. I seen somebody at a show one time that had these things over their fingers no. so that whenever they like do the no. chords, it doesn't hurt Ooh. their fingers. I was like, that's cheating. That don't, that don't, <laughs> I, I don't know about that. That's yeah. I'm going to be a little bit of a, of a, that's gross. To, <laughs> pardon my French, but like, if you do that, just sell your guitar. Just go. Just put it down and move on. I mean, <laughs> I mean, for for to me, that would make it even more difficult first. But I just think that like that's almost. I'm not, I'm not a guitar player, but to me, that would almost be like a badge of honor. You know, when yeah. you have those. Oh, dude, I'm proud calluses. of these calluses right here. Yeah. Tap these things on something. They make a nice clicky noise sometimes. You know. People put, are just put getting candles out. Super easy. Yep. I, I would say so. Actually, it, it, it just people are getting. I'm becoming a bunch of wusses. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I've seen what you're talking about, and I don't know how you'd even be able to feel the string. The only reason that. you should yeah. have plastic on the ends of your fingers and it should be touching your guitar is if you're Tony Iommi or someone else <laughs> who has had a similar accident that needs that. Not that. In, 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 other, in any other case, like stop being a wuss and just build your calluses up. You probably need the practice anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're running from it that much, you probably need the practice anyway. One of the coolest photos that I've ever seen in my entire life. That would not have been possible if it wasn't if it was for those things. Zach Wild is shredding this guitar, and a, apparently at that show he had played so hard that his fingers were bleeding, mm-hmm. and you just seen blood running down the guitar as he was playing it. And that was one of the sickest pictures that I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm like, that's what rock and roll was all about. Yeah, dude. Right there is that you, passion, if that you energy. you put in the time to get, and I'm not saying I'm some kind of great guitar player, but if you put in the time to get decent at it, like at some point or another, you've probably made your hands bleed yeah. from doing it. I mean, whether it's like a split nail or, you know, tore a callus off or something like that, I've, I know I for sure have done it. I remember I used to have a little PV Predator Pro, and I, I know for sure I bled on that thing. Yeah, d- d- to me, I mean, <laughs> that shows how passionate you are about your music and what you're willing to go through to get good at it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And w- without struggles like that, I just don't – I don't know how much that helps a guitarist's and I character. Think that's, one of the, that's one of the big problems is like the, the – with modern music is that all the soul is gone out of it. All the musicality. Yeah. Sapped away from it. Now now it's a formula. It's formulaic and it's made so that masses massive amounts of people can understand it and wanna hear it. And mm-hmm. they, they you know, they even take it down to modeling the beat after the average heartbeat. Like most yeah. pop songs you hear on the radio, same BPM. They you they recycle progressions over and yeah. over. Over and over again. Yeah, have yeah. y'all seen those pictures on the internet? Like, where they show like just like song mashups. That's why you have so many of them. Is exactly what you're talking about. Well, it's it's like a circle of fifths. Yeah. Like like Ed Journey, don't stop believing, and like there's a video other songs. of a comedy group from like uh, Australia, and uh, the song's called Bird Plane, and it's like they I think they worked up like 45 different songs, different pop songs into one song based Mm -hmm. on one progression and whether or not they were playing it regular or double time. Wow. And they just keep cycling through 
telling you the whole time pop music's easy to write look at this mm. these are all the same well and, it, see like I, I i think the music is important of course but i, I love will like what willie says with country music all you need is three chords and the truth mm-hmm. so yeah even like the music might become repetitive but to me it's all about what they what 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 they're singing about or rapping about or whatever type of music well, they you're into the if message you don't, if you don't have a message yeah then why are you even making art to, see that to me is it is, art if it doesn't have a message? Yeah, to me that even that bothers me more than just the music itself. I saw a really good quote the other day, and it was that um, art should disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Mm, I like and that. I, I think that's about as succinct as I could ever put it. Or it's if for it doesn't these have a message, reasons. It doesn't do that. A hundred mm. years from now, people are still going to know what Dark Side of the Moon is and who it, who it was written by, but they ain't going to know who Lil Wayne is. They ain't exactly. gonna know who Jay Z is. Those guys. Ah, well, those are probably the worst they're, examples you could pick from hip hop. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Them. Them two are huge. Yeah. Uh, huge. Jay Z is. Uh, yeah, but like Lil Wayne has stayed relevant for a good I, I, twenty, 20 I, I can, plus years. I can. I can do a good argument. I can do a good rapper. argument on Lil Wayne. I can do a really because we were talking about him. I, I, I would say. Year. I would say people more like like Lil Pump. People, anybody with like nowadays with Lil in front of their name, oh, yeah, Lil going, Uzi Vert or whoever mm-hmm. them people are. I don't even know any of the music by these people. I just know their names. Yeah. But uh, and, and I forgot where we were going with this. Lil Wayne. Anyways, see, I, we were talking about him over the weekend. Me and my wife were because like she brought up the question of who's the greatest rapper of all time. Oh. And, and see, Aesop Rock. I, I was. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> but but. I, See, I, I grew up on classic rock whenever I lived in Virginia with all my family, but I moved to Georgia whenever I, I was like eight. And of course, you had a big hip hop scene down there. Mm-hmm. So I I grew up on like the old Dirty South hip hop with like old school Young Jeezy and Outkast and yeah. people like that. T.I., I love T.I., dude. So like whenever it comes to this mumble rap, I'm not a fan. But when like a- anything 2009 before. I like it, especially the old school hip hop. Mm-hmm. But with Lil Wayne, I I said that he's probably the greatest rapper of all time. And my wife, she One was great quest- showman for sure. But if you think about it, like I can't name another rapper that has his type of catalog and also just the sheer influence on his genre. Mm. I mean, nobody else even comes close yeah, that I, I can think about. Dude. To, he started when he was like what 13 14 yeah he dude he has mixtapes that are bigger than most people's albums yeah like no ceilings exactly <laughs> exactly I mean that's how it's like you can count on Lil Wayne at least like like clockwork at least once every five years he's gonna have a big huge mainstream successful album yeah like that album did you have you listened to the album he put out last year oh dude my, my favorite one uh, was uproar on that yeah. or was that no that was Carter five yeah yeah, yeah. I, I haven't got a chance to listen to uh, that dude. one much. Do it, man. Dude, it's him doing what he does best. Like, there's not a lot of hooks. It's just straight bars. I, I thought, there are whole songs that don't have a hook. I don't have them. Like, Will Wayne has, like, my... I don't know if he's the best rapper in that sense, but he definitely has, like, one of the biggest impacts. Well, I mean, music. look at, like... He's he's very forward-thinking, I think, in a lot of ways, because if you look at, like, Rebirth and him trying to infuse rock music into, into rap, uh-huh. look at what's happening nowadays. Yeah. That's uh, like a big thing right now is a lot of these these young emo rappers and stuff are starting to cross over into rock music now and the same like playing guitars like Machine Gun Kelly, people like yeah. that. And Lil Wayne, he done that. What was that one album? Reload or Reborn or something? Rebirth. Yeah, Rebirth, yeah. yeah. And, yeah and, and, and it wasn't a great album by him, in my opinion. But Drop the, the World idea, was a good song, The idea though. of what he was trying to do was very forward thinking. Haven't they been doing that for a while now, though? What do you mean? Well, Typically, I mean, it was the other way around. Yeah. Typically, you had rock bands that would bring in rappers. Macho Man Randy Savage you know, was a rapper about, like, one time. Biscuit and Rage Against Ooh, the Machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like Lil Wayne, though, like he uh, he tried to do the like rock st- uh, stuff before anybody else was doing it. He had all the face tattoos before mm-hmm. anybody else had it. He was doing auto tune before anybody SoundCloud else had it. SoundCloud rap would not exist without Lil Wayne. No, it wouldn't. I mean, with with Lil Wayne, he might not be the best rapper alive, but, he's but his seriously impact, good. Yeah, yeah. his his <laughs> impact on just hip hop as a whole cannot be. Disputed. I'm sorry. I didn't mean. To, I must I confess, mean I'm, I'm out of my element around. when it comes to rap. I just, I, I, can't, it, I can't listen to. I don't listen to a lot of music anyway. Like I've got what I like because yeah. that's what I listened to when I was a lot younger, and occasionally I listen to some music. But 
for the most part, I can't do it without it influencing what we're trying to write yeah. and play. And we try so, to we try to avoid that. Like if we're in a period of heavy writing, I won't listen to music either. That's good. I though. Just whatever whatever comes out of us, I, like, I, that's what I want. Oh yeah. Well, fun fact about Lil Wayne, real quick. Uh, Alex downstairs, he said that he started recording when he was eleven. Yeah, super Pretty young, wild. dude. He had he had like a big album by the time he was thirteen, fourteen. It's crazy. I'm not well, mistaken. what was that one song back in the day? Uh, it was like one of the first big hits that he was on. He was featured on it, and I for, he was like fifteen at the time. Was it uh, "Stunting Like My Daddy"? Yeah, Birdman? yeah, yeah, that was yeah. it, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember listening to that man and loving it. But like, what well, was he's he? He's very influenced by the old school stuff, like New Orleans hip hop and like uh, like house music and stuff from down there. Yeah. So he's his influences go back real far. I, I like uh, his interview whenever he was uh, being arrested the first time and they were <laughs> doing the interview and mm-hmm. he was just shutting down every question. I don't know. He's gangster. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, Wayne. You know, yeah. Our goal is to one day play a gig on the moon. That would be pretty. Metallic is probably going to be the first one to do no that. No way, man. No they way. got seven. They got all seven continents. I don't think commercial space flight's going to get there before Metallica is, Wait, is that, too old. Well, to do there's, it. there's already been a guitar player in space. That's already happened. One of the NASA guys yeah, brought his guitar. That's, but that was with a grandpa's guitar. That was an acoustic. I'm True. talking about echoes, delays, how, gain. <laughs> how can you get all the... Well, they have to have electricity, We're right? How build does a that dome. work? We want to test that space is a vacuum. There is no sound theory. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we want to put that to the test. I think we're going to have to build a dome on the moon, I think, is what it's, what it's Team up take. with Elon Musk, and he'll yeah. help you figure all this Maybe out. Maybe we should, we should, when we share this video, we should tag Elon Musk in and be like, hey, help us make this happen. Let's, let's, <laughs> and, and that dude is crazy enough to, like, hit y'all back up and like, yeah, sure, yeah, let's he do might it. do it. <laughs> if we put it on Twitter, he might be like, yeah, all right, let's figure it out. <laughs> if, if, if he was born here in America, that dude would have already ran for president yeah. by now. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that the other day, like, who's going to be the next celebrity-type figure, too? And it has to be a crazy billionaire. Has to be. You would think. Maybe. I'm not going to get like political or anything. I'd like to, no I'd like to see Snoop Dogg run for president. That would be kind of fun. I'd like, vote for Snoop Dogg. Honestly, you know, it would be funny, but he wouldn't get the votes. No. But if Denzel Washington ran for president, He'd get straight up voted in. You never know, man. Why you never people know. would be voting him in? Like, well, that's Denzel. 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 I love yeah. that guy. <laughs> that, that, that voice. You know, yeah, just, he's, just calm, or Morgan reassuring. Freeman. He's Morgan a, Freeman would be another good one. You know, Morgan I, Freeman would be an excellent president. Mm-hmm. He, he would. Just, he would make you feel calm and secure. He'd be know? able to explain things to you in a way that you understand. What about well, the, the American? What if The Rock ran for president? I don't think Put that's even far-fetched. Put the people's elbow on I don't, Iraq. I don't yeah. even Take think that's Al-Qaeda. far-fetched. If I don't even think that's far-fetched. I think he could be. realistically do it. Uh, didn't he talk about it at I one time? So. I, I think so. I remember seeing an article, something about it. Like That would be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I'm not political by any stretch of the no. imagination, and I'm not going to dive into it. But like really, man, I would just... Because there, there's going to be another one. You, there mm-hmm. has to be. You had the precedent has been set at this point. Exactly. <laughs> so I mean, like it's an open playing field for anybody if you have enough money and influence. Right. So 2024, you're going to have somebody come out of the woodworks, and I just don't know who it's going to be. Damn millennials are going to elect somebody ridiculous. You're a millennial. You're yeah. a millennial, <laughs> we're, we're, dude. I didn't. I didn't know that I fell into the category of a millennial oh, we're all until like last room, week or the week before. It yeah. broke my heart because uh, I was like, I'm not millennial. It's, it's well, everybody. See, the thing under about me. it is, though, most of the stupid crap that gets attributed to millennials is actually Gen Z stuff. Yeah, it's kids that were born like '95 or later. So, like, I'm late millennial. I'm '92. So. Yeah. Well, I was, I was, I was 95, like so I caught it like 80s. right at the end. Yeah. If I would have got born like one year later, I would have yeah. been in Z. Dangerous territory, yeah, my man. friend. Yeah, man. <laughs> I was born in the 80s. That's know. millennial, dude. Yeah. Or it's like late 70s. Gen X was after the baby boomers, like the late 60s to the uh, late 70s, and then it's millennials from the early 80s to the mid 90s. The commercial thing from back in the day. The Pepsi generation. No, no, that's what that's that's how it shakes out. You are for sure a millennial. What what is what is it now? The things that people like to act like they are, like millennials are like the oldest millennials at this point are like in their 40s. 
dude mm-hmm. working <laughs> what, what is it nowadays like what's, what's this type of generation gen called? z is the ones that are like teenagers right now that are coming to age that are like eating tide pods but if they and, yeah, <laughs> wearing really tight pants and fedoras <laughs> yeah. fedoras are kind of cool ish yeah. wearing champion like it's some kind of designer brand when we could have bought it at walmart back one, when we one were kids. per crew <laughs> one per crew yeah you're gonna have the and one next yeah. like all that yeah, and one's gonna blow up or like shacks Shacks are going to get big. <laughs> Shacks, ten, Shacks. Shacks tennis shoes. Dude, they're still at Walmart. Still? And actually, I learned that he donates half of the money he makes from every pair of shoes to uh, to like kids in the inner cities and stuff like that. Man, if I'm not I mistaken. I did not know that. That's cool. have him check that. Yeah. But he does donate a lot of those proceeds to some charity or, or something. And like he wanted, he like he had offers to put his shoes in nicer stores and stuff, and he didn't want to do it. You know, Shaq he used wanted to, to keep them cheap. You know, he used to be a rapper? Yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I got vinyl records. Dude, like Shaq, Shaq can play bass. As well, he was also the genie. Yeah, it, it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't Sinbad. It was Shaq. Mm-hmm. Apparently, I don't mm-hmm. know about no, all we're that. Talking about the Mandela effect. Yeah, bro. we don't need to get into. Let's not. Hey, let's one, not, one thing that I did want to ask y'all it about was though, CERN, CERN did it. CERN tore the It was the Bearstein Bears. They're the one that started it all. Those dang bears. The Hadron Super Collider. I, 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 I was in Head Start the second grade in the early nineties, dude. I, uh, and I vividly remember reading those books like they were all over the classroom back in those days like, man if you read a book between 90 and 94 in a school most likely it was the Bernstein bears well well nowadays though like scientists are already proving that different dimensions exist and we don't know like how necessarily to get into those or what starts them or like you know, whatever you know what the super the hadron super collider is CERN? Is that the one that uh, stabilized the atom and no, then no. teleported it? The super collider it? is, I know what you're talking about there, but no, the super collider is this thing, and I'm no, I'm not a scientist, so I'll give you my most basic rundown of it from, from an idiot, okay? Mm. But they shoot subatomic particles at each other at speeds approaching the speed of light in order to try to find this particle that they thought existed. It was called the Higgs boson. And that opened and went. What's the Higgs boson? Sorry, it, they call it the God particle. I don't know what all that means. I don't okay. know. That's as far as my understanding of it goes. But there was there was like a debate among the scientific community as to whether or not the energies they were creating were going to make tiny black holes, and whether or not it would destroy the Earth. Mm. And this mm-hmm. was in 2008 that it happened. And if you think about it, things went kind of crazy after 2008. So I my theory is hmm. the universe was destroyed by CERN in 2008 in an alternate timeline, and now we're living the weird reality that's left over in the reality where it didn't. Oh, that's deep. That's where I think we're at, bro. But the thing is, <laughs> and, and most people would look at that as like far out there and far-fetched and a conspiracy theory, but these scientists like really are on the verge of playing God. Nuclear physics almost. are crazy, man. Yeah, and it's, I mean, like we need like to be... He's making it up. No, like, it's yeah. there. Like, yeah, they I, have that. They had concerns about it, like there were, I mean, you can look up news articles from 2008. They were like, is this going to create black holes and destroy the earth? Like, we don't know. Yeah. They were basically they fired they were this just thing, shooting. This like 17 miles long, and they fired this thing up and said, all right, let's do it, boys. Like, <laughs> and, <laughs> who knows and, what's going to happen? And all it takes is that one scientist to be gutsy enough mm-hmm. or just not care enough to push that. It's kind of like the Manhattan Project. It, it, you know, yeah, oh, they yeah. weren't they weren't <clears throat> sure that that wasn't going to set the is, entire atmosphere on wait, fire. Wait, wait, is that the one? <laughs> is that the one with the ship that disappeared? No, that's the nuclear, that the, the first nuclear Project. bombs. Oh, well, they, I, when they were first theorizing it, like there were a lot of scientists that were like, "Hey, man, if you set this thing off, there's a good chance it's going to set the entire atmosphere on fire." Kill us all. Like the math shook out to make that more likely than the than the alternative. It oh, all God. it all pretty much reads out like a. <clears throat> the horrible accident that created the supervillain in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know, like. Well, you know, that's, an, that's another thing I was thinking about, too, with all these, like, crazy billionaires. I mean, Elon Musk is already a real-life Tony Stark. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a real thing. You could order a flamethrower but like, right now. And, and, and to right <laughs> now, Musk's it seems companies. like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and all these really rich people have a good head on their shoulders. Mm-hmm. But will there come a time... Where there's a crazy billionaire that's off his rocker and that has enough money just to do whatever he wants to with and, and becomes but, the first ever like, real life of, evil genius. And here's another thing that people don't consider they don't realize how powerful these men really are. Because the difference between, like, a millionaire billionaire sounds similar, 
when you say those things, and it's easy to lump them all into one category and say, oh, that's rich people. But there is such a vast difference between a millionaire and a billionaire. Like if you were to convert dollars to seconds, a million seconds is like a week. A billion seconds is like 34 years. Yeah. Like there's exactly. a vast difference, and they have so much power with that much money. And I'm not sure that Jeff Bezos is I'm man, crazy. Man, let me really tell you knows. something, buddy. You don't get that much money unless you're just a little bit evil. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, yeah. Well, nobody gets that much power. Well, uh, nobody unless, has but, but, that much exactly. without without doing some really shady things. There's some kind That's, of despotic behavior going on there. I'm pretty sure. Exactly. Like imagine if Kim Kim Jong Un had as much money as Jeff Bezos did. Oh, God. I mean, that would be scary to think about. But the thing is, though, that possibility is not, not out of the realm. Yeah, yeah, it's not. That's totally possible like, in this day and age. The point is, like, it's it's probably a little bit of moral ambiguity involved in anybody that gets to that point of being that rich. So yeah. the re- the possibility for any of them to just snap and go off the deep end is there. <laughs> I, I was kind of, I was kind of worried whenever I heard Jeff Bezos was getting divorced because I didn't know how much that woman was going to take, mm-hmm. and I kind of got worried. I'm like, oh, I hope she don't make him mad. Mm-hmm. Yes, we'll we'll see what happens here. Yeah, uh, but the uh, have you heard of the Philadelphia Project? That's the one I got confused with mm-hmm. what you were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. This, this, they tra- they tra- I, I have heard about them they teleporting. Tra- a, a yeah, they article. teleported a, a ship, a U.S. naval ship, in 1943, supposedly mm-hmm. done all but of this. But there is also like documented proof from recent science that they have taken a particle and put it in a teleporter here and moved it. Like, yeah. And it may have only been a few feet, but like moved it along some kind of edge of a different dimension and got yeah. it to pop back up into our, our our perceivable dimensions in a different physical place. Like Yeah, but they've been working on stuff like that since the 40s that right. we know of. Right. You know, so I'm at, and also, I, I come from a very big military family. They kind of, uh, I, and I'll ask questions like that because I had family members that were in weapon development and stuff like, like that. And like one of the things that they've told me is that they'll have patents on information and stuff that they can release to the public. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like I remember them talking about the them teleporting that atom, but they probably done that 15 years ago mm-hmm. that we know of, and that they're just now releasing mm-hmm. that information. We have no idea. That could they could have already they could already be teleporting people by now, mm-hmm. and we have no idea. You wouldn't know it. Yeah, exactly. It's a very uh, it's a weird thing, man. Great governments food. governments do a lot of shady stuff. Oh yeah, that's and that's government. You can imagine if if we have what we have, what they must have that they ain't telling nobody about. Because well, well, there's a lot of stuff that has fell into that category. Uh, I, I'm not going to say names of my family members, but uh, I had family members that were in uh, the Vietnam era, and they had seen deep like well, it was a uh, kind of like a CD or a DVD, but it it just held information on them. For certain devices, well, but, that, but that's but that's what started the whole laser disc, CD, mm-hmm. DVD movement. They had stuff like that back in the seventies. Uh, super glue, I think, was invented for World War One for the battlefield to like help uh, soldiers put their cuts back together. Mm-hmm. The military was using super glue way before the public ever knew anything about it. Same thing with GPS systems, and the list goes on that's and on. That's the same and on. thing with UFOs. They've been studying UFOs for decades, and they've always denied it, denied it, denied it, and now they're releasing footage of UFOs. And yeah. They're like admitting that there admitting was something that happening that they had no idea what it was and could not explain that it. That it still well, happens. Well, it's coming to the day and age. See, like back in the day, only a handful of people would have seen something. If you would have seen something, you didn't have a camera or anything ready to get whatever it was. And Immediately discredited. Exactly. But nowadays, <laughs> where everybody has this supercomputer right in the palm of their hand, they, they have to say that something is out there. I don't know if like we have actual aliens or even if our government knows what's going on but they definitely well, mathematically it's impossible that we're alone in this universe well i've already i, I try to explain that to people it, it, anybody that believes that we're alone in this universe really needs to do some research into astronomy it the, does the not Fermi make paradox, sense you know yeah. the, the the numbers of it just don't <laughs> shake out well man. this is what i like to tell people i say that okay our sun is a star it has re- what is like eight or nine planets revolving yeah. around it. However, you look yeah. at Pluto, eight but uh, in a planetoid. Mm-hmm. yeah, but so but you look up in the sky if here in little old Harold, Kentucky, and see hundreds of thousands of stars. And every little inch of that sky that you can perceive is billions of stars, trillions of stars. Exactly, maybe, you know, and well, each of those has how many planets rotating around. Them exactly, and, and that's right. only like a 10 percent of the sky. 
as we know it that, that we can even observe. No, yeah. so, unfathomably large. I mean, <laughs> like, it's so slow. it's what we can observe is so small and is so large to us that it's absolutely ridiculous nonsense to think that we're the only living things anywhere. Yeah, that just doesn't even make sense. It's I not just logical. I just don't know if we matter that much. It's a very narcissistic worldview to think that we're alone. You know, yeah. like, but, <laughs> but like, I just think that they could possibly be leaving us alone because I mean, we just well, we've shown a great a great aptitude for destruction. Yeah, like and we may not have the knowledge, but we're really good at manipulating things to make them deadly. Look, there's a <laughs> whole lot. There's a whole lot of reported cases by. High-ranking members of the military, people that worked at these nuclear bases who saw uh, UFOs around the bases, experienced power failures, things of that nature. Yeah. And uh, they we, said it was almost like they were just flexing on them. Like yeah. they just showed up, they shut everything down and was like, boom, we can do this anytime we want. And they just, out into space they go. Yeah, and, and maybe... Why wouldn't they? Yeah, well, you know, that's... Well, back, see, I study a lot of history, too. And a lot of ancient cultures will talk about the watchers. Hindus. That's what, especially. Like oh, the yeah. Vedas, man. Well, well Hindu, I mean, Mayans, and, Aztecs, the list. You got saucers in cave paintings and etched yeah. into stone. What are the chances that cultures? people on separate continents, and by those separate continents, I mean Africa and South America, around the same time period were building pyramids that were aligned with similar constellations? And there was no, like, seafaring, they, neither of them were seafaring cultures, the Egyptians and the Mayans. But they were both building pyramids aligned in similar fashions on totally separate continents around the same period of time, like within a relatively small window of time. But, what are the chances? Yeah. But it is. It, <laughs> but the sea, the sea uh, bearing thing, though, is one that kind of uh, is tricky to me because now like, they're showing evidence that they may have been traveling the seas. At yeah. that time, but it was the uh, Phoenicians. I think Phoenicians. Are the earliest civilization. Yes, they because about. Uh, there's one. I just learned about this like two weeks ago. I never knew this place existed. But uh, in New Hampshire, they have what they call America's Stonehenge, mm -hmm. and it has a lot of the sim similar characteristics of the one in England. Whenever it comes to stones being aligned with the stars and all that, but it also has like sacrificial tables, mm -hmm. and the list goes on and on and on. But it's this amazing site that they think was constructed about 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it ha like they can't it, – it doesn't match anything that the Native Americans had going on. It doesn't match anything that our European ancestors would have had. But it does match a lot of the Polynesians. And they think that that group of people, they don't exactly know how advanced they were. Mm -hmm. So they could have very well, well been traveling been, the seas. That's always been my thing, too, point. is like, you know, there were cars that were built in the 50s. It was only a relatively short amount, like a one human lifespan ago, 70 years ago, that have now sat in yards and rusted away to the point that you would hardly be able to tell that they were there. So over the course of 4,000 years, like, who knows what all has disappeared? Who knows how exactly. advanced those civilizations were? And, and that's There's no what, way to know. And, I, dude, I get into this argument so much with people because, yeah, whenever it comes to – structures like Stonehenge if or they Machu Picchu. If they stars that well, they weren't stupid. Not well, just well, but but, were, but also back then, that's all they had going for them. Right. So like, I think that has to do with like the stars. But like, you, you, you had some weird stuff when it comes to the Watchers or just people that they said visited them. Mm. But uh, You ever do any research on the uh, Nazca lines down in Peru? Oh, oh yeah. Those yeah. big pictures. And people just thought, well, that's a weird-looking dog or that's a weird-looking monkey. It turns out they're directly related to specific constellations. Yeah. And also, how do you sky. design something like that without being able to get an From aerial the ground, view huh? of it? From it, the ground. It, they it, designed it, it. Wait, is that the one like where it's like these big uh, images in the side of mountains that like are only visible well, these are from on, the like, air? The plains in Peru. Yeah. They're like they're in the big, plateaus giant, too. Like yeah. you got rising plateaus. Mastodon yeah, talks they, about in some of their lyrics. And mm -hmm. uh, oh man, what else they have? They have what look like runways. Yeah, big, well, <clears> long, <throat> straight runways. A monkey, a couple of dogs. Boys, we have jumped birds. straight down the rabbit hole in here. I love, I love it. <laughs> See, this is right up my alley. But to to let's me, get weird. <laughs> hey, let's get weird. I don't care. See, but but I, I like I like to uh, think of the possibility though that. There have been catastrophic events that have took place and basically put us back in the, in the Stone Age. The Hindu yeah. holy books, like if you look at them, like they they talk about well, spaceships yeah. in the sky having nuclear battles. Yeah. Uh, well, what was that? Uh, the battle of uh, 
R- R- Rajin, I forget. I can't remember the names <clears throat> yeah. of any of them, but like I know yeah. that the ships that they refer to specifically, I remember those were called Vimanas. Yeah, and, and, and there's it, like explanations of how they worked and stuff in there. Like, yeah, but but like you were saying though, and that's my one argument for lost civilizations. A lot of what we have nowadays, the shirts that we're wearing, us as a whole, all of this that's around us right now, is not going to stand the test of time. Mm-hmm. But what does, if it's not purposely destroyed by human beings or in a catastrophic event or whatever, is stone structures. And that's why the pyramids, the uh, Stonehenge, Machu Picchu, all these old ancient sites are still there. And what's even crazier to think about is, excuse me, is one day in a few thousand years, if there is another catastrophic event that puts us back in the Stone Age, one day Mount Rushmore is going to be like the Great Pyramids of Giza. And that's pretty, that's pretty crazy, crazy to think, think about. about. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So they're going to unearth George Washington's yeah. head at some well, point. Like, here's like, another what? question. Well, there were people here's another well, question. Well, like, well, but, well, they, well they, done, they done that right, though, because apparently, and this isn't just in the National Treasure movie, this is a real thing. They like in, in Mount Rushmore, there's this area that they have like that's sealed off that has nothing but artifacts from America. Mm-hmm. So whenever people do find it, yeah, they're going to find a lot of what we were if it isn't all lost by then. We're mm-hmm. going to find a mixtape with, I am a real American. Oh, man. <laughs> right oh, like, wow, this, this place right. was awesome. That's <laughs> what I'm talking really about. Great. Hulk Hogan <laughs> yeah, see, dancing around to it, like obviously fake miming on a guitar. <laughs> Yeah. But I heard a great Love quote it. the other day, and I've probably said this before on here, but uh, it was from Einstein. He said, I don't know what World War Three will be fought with, but I know that World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones. Mm-hmm. Whew, man, that's mm-hmm. a good quote. He he, good quote. Uh, he wrote that while he was working on the Manhattan Project. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. While they were building the atom bombs, man. <laughs> so even Einstein's like, hey, God, I'm... I'm yeah, <laughs> dude, he knew it was a bad idea. All, a lot of those guys knew it was a bad idea. It's a terrible yeah. idea. Like, that's what I said. They, they thought that they might set the atmosphere on fire, but you know what? Like, it's all good. Well, let's try it anyway. <laughs> There's a whole lot of atmosphere. It's going to be hard to set it all on atmosphere. fire. <laughs> It, man, the math was there. Like I've I've read about that to a pretty healthy. I'm also I love history, man. Yeah, and it's, I love it's especially the un, the untold parts of history that you don't mm-hmm. learn in a in an elementary school textbook that you have to look for yourself. Well, <laughs> well, nowadays history, in my opinion, it almost shouldn't even be taught in school because yeah. they're rewriting history every single day. If you're going to teach history in school, mm-hmm. you're going to have to do it on a day-to-day basis because they're rewriting history every single day. Mm-hmm. Like they found some I think um, it's dangerous. We don't there's get, a lot of misinformation. We yeah, there is history. We get the subjective history according to our government at the time. The winner yeah. writes the history books. Mm-hmm. I love that quote. <clears throat> but uh yeah, I mean, like they think that uh There was human beings here in America 130,000 years ago because they found mastodon bones in San Francisco, and like the mastodon bones were cracked open, and the only creature that could have done that at the time were humans. And like another bone was like put into the ground vertically. Again, we're the only ones that could have done that. It's a... and that rewrites all of history right there. Or, you know, like the the various other offshoots of primate evolution that may have been killed out or died out by Homo sapiens yeah, up to exactly. this point. You know, there were the Denisovans and, like, Neanderthals are a little bit different than Homo sapiens. Cro-Magnons are a little bit different. There was a lot of interbreeding, but there could have been an entirely different branch of evolution of human that was here at that time. Yeah. Even, when, it, you know. Three but, years ago, down in Peru, they were going through some of those old structures and stuff, and they come across some bodies. Some of them were really small. But one of them was the size of a full-grown female adult. Mm-hmm. It had three fingers, three toes, and an elongated skeleton. They dated it 1,800 year plus years old, at least wow. 1,800 years old, covered in a dust that dried it out and preserved it and kept it so well preserved that all the internal organs were still there and everything. That's weird. They've DNA tested it. They don't know what it is because it's not human, but it's there. They found yeah. it. It's there. It exists somewhere. Well, well see, so that's that's another thing. You know, like who? Are, why with all these different types of animals and subspecies of animals? Uh, dragons, I mean, dude. Yeah, dragons well, very well could have existed. Who knows? If they could fly, they probably had hollow. Well, I'm gonna let me let me say this because I'm a big fan of dragons because dragons are dope. <laughs> 
but dragons definitely could have existed. A lot of cultures around the world would talk about them at the same time. What are you doing to me right now? Oh, Game of Thrones. Okay. But if they could fly, dude, they probably had hollow bones like birds, and those are not going to be preserved in fossils. Why do all these different cultures have dragons? Why do you think they have hollow bones, though? Huh? Why do you think they have For the fact that they flew. Like, do that's birds, how birds have hollow bones? Yes, yeah. that's how birds are able to fly. That's how their really? weight is low enough. So, and they still have the bone structures that. that have wings that large because their bones are hollow. Yeah, well, look at huh. the thing about the inside of a plane. It's hollow. The wings yeah. are hollow. And, 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 but also, though, like they might not have been as big as everybody says they were either. They may not. You know? Hashtag Dragon Gate. <laughs> Dragon Gate. <laughs> right, well, well stuff goes extinct every single day. I mean, it's kind of far fetched to say that something didn't exist. Kind of like Bigfoot, you know. Mm -hmm. There's that could have been another subspecies of human, like mm -hmm. we were talking about. Who or, knows? Or it could just be some guy's drunk friend out in the woods, a hollering. Yeah. That could be all that was. I, I just a lot of those videos you go out are just the woods, a drunk guy hollering. You go out into the woods in Eastern Kentucky any given night, you're liable to hear some hollering, have, some have, strange hollering. Have y'all heard? Have y'all <laughs> seen the thing about the Yeti that they discovered in Indonesia? I think it is like mm. at this monk temple they have like the top of the skull and the hand of it and they won't let anybody do any type of testing on it because they consider it sacred and apparently like one of the monks found it in a cave like a few years ago i forget how long they it was it. but yeah they won't let it, they won't let anybody touch it man it just you never know you never and know they found that body in peru they wouldn't let the government touch it because no, the government would just adulterate it or put out false information about it. They wanted yeah. to figure out what they were looking at first, then they would release that well, information. Well, that, see, that, that's another thing, too, that's really uh, pushed back science is just egos and disinformation. See, I was watching this. Uh, I forget exactly which archaeological site it was, but there was the scientist that had a theory about it. I've went down the rabbit hole of so many of these videos, I can't remember which one this is. But uh, – at the site, he had a theory as to what happened here and who lived here or whatever. And anything that didn't fit that theory, he would have it destroyed. I mean, all these ancient artifacts and everything just to kind of – Well, I mean, for his, dude, you got to look at like throughout history, people like uh, Kepler – yeah. And his model of the solar system, he was considered a crackpot, absolute madman at his time. In yeah. his time, and now we're like, okay, so he basically figured out that planets are round. Yeah, you know I, what I mean, like. Yeah, and, and we're going to do the same thing with a lot of scientists like that nowadays. Graham yeah. Hancock's one of my favorite, but people look I at him really as a him. like his TED. His TED talks about man, like psychedelia. And he the human is mind fascinating. And stuff very cool. But just like. <sighs> You, you can, you can, <clears throat> but how ridiculed he is by the scientific community mm -hmm. just breaks my heart. But he, he does get to kind of shove it in their face every once in a while when they, they prove it's right. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, not to get off track, but I wanted to ask y'all about this because I didn't know what in the world this was whenever you shared it on Facebook. What is the Edgar Case? Case? Mm -hmm. Case? Edgar Case. Case? See, I didn't, I was not actually aware of him until I shared that meme. But apparently he was a mysticist, and he was he was uh, he was very rooted in in Christian ideologies. He was like a a, a pastor or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. But he talks about some pretty interesting stuff, man. Like I started reading very loudly mm -hmm. on what he was talking about. And uh, you're talking about the music. Once you under yeah. understand music, you'll understand all things. Yeah, if you learn music, you'll learn most well, all me, there is to let know. Let me let me uh, quote Bill Hicks and say Bill that Hicks. all matter is just. Energy condensed to a slow vibration. Yep. Vibration <laughs> controls everything in this universe, period. So, and here's Ted with the news. Yeah, yeah, and here's Ted with the news. Well, if, if, you watch, if you watch anything about physics or astronomy and you hear these really, really smart scientist guys talk about the universe, they always talk about it in musical terms. Uh -huh. yeah. Always. Like, I've watched probably 200 UFO documentaries when they start talking in bold, big terms about we are this to the universe. It's always in musical terms. Always, hmm. they well, never yeah. not do it in musical terms. Every th the state of something, the state of matter that something is is can, is is determined by how fast it's vibrating. Yeah. And, There's and, no scientific explanation for why you can hear a certain frequency and it will make you feel a certain way. Hmm. And like, have you ever heard of Adam Neely? You know who that is. He's a guy that does really a YouTube familiar. channel. It's a lot about music theory and stuff like that. He did a sort of like, it wasn't at a TED Talk. I can't remember exactly what the name of the event was, but he did a talk that was similar to like a TED Talk about how polyrhythms. You know what a polyrhythm is? Mm -hmm. When you take like, for instance, smart, okay, so <laughs> Tool uses a lot of polyrhythms in their music. And if you take a drummer, they will play something that's in odd time, like five, 
with their hand, and then mm-hmm. what they're doing on the kick will be in four. And those two things will overlap in the same space of time, even though they're different time signatures. That's what's called a polyrhythm. Hmm. So you'll have a 5-4 beat over a 4-4 four, four beat, but they both resolve at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it creates a really weird sound. But if you take a polyrhythm and speed it up, so the point at which a rhythm turns into a frequency is around 18, like somewhere between like 18 to 20 hertz is where the human ear starts to perceive a rhythm as a frequency. If you take a polyrhythm, like a six over five over four polyrhythm, so there's one one beat that's going one, two, three, four, five, six, and in the same space of time, there's one that's going one, two, three, four, five, and then there's another one that's doing four in the same space of time. If you take that polyrhythm and speed it up past that 18 hertz barrier, it becomes a major chord. Dude. <laughs> and then if you take if you take those oh same God. those same relationships of frequencies and speed them up octave orders by orders of 12, you can identify them to the frequencies of light in the visible light spectrum. Wow. Our entire universe is based around that 12 that I don't, I can't explain it, but vibration controls everything. I, I, I seen this one video where they took the sound of vibrations and somehow put it over sand mm-hmm. and certain vibrations would make a certain design right. in the sand. That right. that blew my mind. That's what I'm. That's what that's what it like to understand music is to understand all things because there is no like you just know it in your heart. Like if mm-hmm. you're somebody who's really into music, whether you're a musician or not, you know that a certain sound, a certain collection of sounds, will make you feel a certain way. There is no scientific basis for why music can transmit emotion from mm-hmm. one human to another. It's magic. It really is. And the, one of the most magical things about music, in my opinion, is how it can bring everybody together. Mm-hmm. You know, no matter what type of background you're from, whether you're country or city or no matter ethnicity, age, everybody likes music. And everybody is receptive to similar things. Yeah. But it's, but it's weird, though, because not a lot of people like art, like just paintings. Not everybody likes sports. Not everybody likes a lot of stuff. But everybody likes music mm-hmm. to some degree or another yeah like, and the people who don't like music are real weird birds like there are a few and far between people who just don't but, like music at all but they are some weird cats man if you get to talking to those people though i've talked to a few of them and They're you'll angry. you'll you'll find little glimpses they'll like the song to this tv show that they yeah. like or yeah. they're, they're still that they yeah. say that they don't but in little cases at some music. point and, and and a lot of that goes back to like when we were tribal societies i think you know a lot of like war drums tribal war drums yeah. stuff like that started as ways to if you got separated from your tribe and you were traveling in the night trying to find them again and you heard a rhythm that wasn't the one that your tribe typically did you'd yeah. be like well i'm not gonna go over there that's a different group of people but then if you heard the one that was you're like there's my people i'm going to them you know like yeah that still happens people still group themselves based on what kind of sounds they like Man, never (laughs) thought about that. Dude, we got deep on this one. I loved it. But, man, we've been talking for so long right now. Yeah, we went went, went deep. Oh, man. Hey, it was fun, though. God, this was fun. Can I throw a a quick shout-out, though? Throw as many shout-outs as you need, man. so, album. Yes. Oh, yeah, we were talking about the album. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, February 26th. That's a Friday, too. Nice. But um, we're dropping the album on February 26th. We will also be doing a live stream concert from the Mountain Arts Center studio that day. And that concert will be benefiting um, the Dance Blue Clinic at UK. Nice, man. That's we're cool. Gonna, anything that we were going to try to take donations during the live stream mm-hmm. and anything that we make, like the, the show itself is already paid for. Everything's already done in that regard. And uh, we're going to try to take donations and donate all of them to uh, Dance Blue because my son, over the past year, while we were making this album, uh, came down with a had a tumor behind his eye. Yeah, I've seen that. And we had to go to up there, and I didn't really have any way to give back to him, but if I can use the music to do that, that's that's what I'm trying to do. That's so cool, man. Hopefully we can raise a little bit of money, and people will be able to you know, throw five bucks on it or something that they would be spending on something else, and we can raise some money to help them out. And, and uh, where, where is this going to be? Is this going to be on your Facebook page? Yeah, we'll 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 announce everything officially. Like this is the first time we've mentioned this to anybody outside of our it's own exciting. Group. So <laughs> we'll announce everything, and we'll have a lot of news about it on the page, and we'll establish links and everything. We're going to try to stream it to multiple platforms. Cool. We're man. going to try to go to YouTube and Instagram and Facebook at least, but we'll have to see how that shakes out exactly. Nice. But, well, yeah, y'all are going to be in good hands with Brandon. Yeah. And Brandon's we're going to be performing genius. the album from front to back. 
Nice. Like we're going to do the whole album live the day of the release. Hey, so, and do you know what time or anything? Just don't have a specific time yet, but it's going to be like, I want to try to time it so that we finish our performance of the album <clears> at <throat> the same time as the album officially drops. Cool, dude. So, That's that man. Y'all are, I, I like you. I like your minds. We try to if be that thoughtful sense. about things, man. There's a lot of deliberation that it, goes on. More artists need to be that way, though, because yeah. you can really care. You can see that you care a lot about what you guys are doing. It's the most and it's important exciting. thing to us, man. Like, it, I live for it. Yeah. I live for playing music. Like, I it, love my. I live for my kids, you know, first and foremost. But like, outside of that, everything else in my life could fall away. And if I could still pick up a guitar and play music with these dudes, I'm okay. Well man, <laughs> well, man, it has been an absolute pleasure. I, Absolutely. It has Likewise. been a lot of fun, dude. I've had I've, a great time. I have, too. And uh, for everybody that wants to check y'all out and get it updated about the album drop and the show and all that good stuff, how do they do it? Uh, they can check us out on Facebook. That's our most prominent place. But we're also on Instagram. We're on TikTok, YouTube, uh, Twitter, anywhere. Anywhere they want to go. And, I mean, I'm probably not as active on some of the other stuff as I am on Facebook. So I would say definitely check there first. But anywhere on there, they can get up with us. Well, man, I fully support what y'all are doing. It's, it's you, awesome man. to have this type of sound come out of this area. And uh, I, I'm excited to see what the future holds for y'all. Thank Thanks, you, man. man. We're excited, too. We think, we're, we think we might do something with it, hopefully. We're going to keep trying, for sure. I mean, we're going to work at it for as long as uh, until somebody makes us stop. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, whenever y'all drop the album, man, hit me up, and we'll have y'all back up here, and uh, we'll dive down even further down the rabbit hole. Get off the beaten like path, a, so to speak. That sounds like a good, <laughs> a good plan. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Waylon Whitson, Stephen Cottle of Technico or Nightmare. Eli Griffith of the Homegrown Happy Hour podcast, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> See y'all next week, folks. Boom. <laughs> Dude, that was...